Welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Gus Moreno to discuss his new horror thriller, This Thing Between Us, in conversation with Jeff Vandermeer. Uh, my name is Adam Schuhos, and I'm a bookseller and events host at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, whether you know us well or this is your first time hearing our name, thank you so much for being part of our community today. And thank you so much for supporting an independent bookstore through your book purchases. And thank you for supporting the wonderful work of Gus Moreno. Now, I first want to thank Jeff Vandermeer for moderating tonight's event. Jeff is the author of Dead Astronauts, Born, and the Southern Reach Trilogy, the first volume of which Annihilation won the Nebula Award and the Shirley Jackson Award and was adapted into a movie by Alex Garland. Jeff speaks and writes frequently about issues relating to climate change. His latest book, Humming Hummingbird Salamander, is a brilliant cinematic novel that wraps profound questions about climate change, identity, and the world we live in into a tightly plotted thriller full of unexpected twists and elaborate conspiracy. Jeff, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. And it is my utter pleasure to introduce our guest star for this evening, Gus Moreno. Gus Moreno's stories have appeared in Aurealis, Pseudopod, Blue Stem Magazine, and the anthology Burnt Tongues. And of course, his latest novel, This Thing Between Us, a bold, original horror novel in which a widower battles his grief, rage, and the mysterious evil inhabiting his home smart speaker, displaying the oppressive intimacy of technology. Now, it is a joy to say, please join me in welcoming Jeff Vandermeer and Gus Moreno. Thanks again. Uh, and I'd just like to, to say what a, a pleasure it is to, to be here with you, Gus, and, and um, to talk about this thing between us. To give the audience just a, a quick summary, if uh, they're not familiar, uh, in the book, the protagonist, Thiago, suffers a trauma, the death of his wife, Vera, uh, under very troubling circumstances. At the same time, strange things have been happening there in their apartment, including, uh, as he mentioned, it's a, a malfunctioning uh, smart uh, speaker. And in the aftermath of all of this, things uh, get ever more uncanny and, and strange. It's a gorgeous book uh, in, in a lot of different, different ways, uh, and, and one way in particular uh, just, just obvious from the get-go is the, the amazing uh, cover uh, from FSG Originals. And then also, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a few things that, that caught, caught my attention. There, there's a scene uh, in the book where uh, Thiago is going to try to uh, figure out what's going on, uh, and he, he encounters someone uh, that he has to speak Spanish with. And, uh, you know, he, he's not as familiar with Spanish, and so it always feels, uh, he says, like, I'm caught in a raging river, and her Spanish was a ribbon trailing behind her. And it was a lovely detail uh, in general, but it was also kind of fraught because, uh, you know, it causes us confusion as to understanding what is going on in a way that may be uh, imperiling to, to the narrator. So I really appreciated that. On the other end of the spectrum, I will just say that later in the novel, um, no one can say you didn't use every part of that dog. Um, so how did you come to write this book? And was it always this glorious, sad, terrifying layering of elements and tropes of quiet horror and not so quiet horror? Um, well, I mean, uh, thank you, Brookline Booksmith. Thank you, uh, Adam. Thank you, Jeff, yeah. so much for doing this. Sure. Um, you know what? That's that's a very good question. It. It started off um, at just as this story that I wanted to write about uh, a man and his wife who, you know, that, that he loses someone. Uh, and ultimately, it was grief that I, I wanted to focus on. It, I didn't want to write a novel where um, we lose the wife in the beginning and then Tiago gets to have all of his adventures and like all of these great things. So I, um, I just wanted to make sure grief just stuck throughout the entire thing. And what ended up happening was that um, the way that grief would constantly present itself was in these um, these moments of escalation. Um, I, like escalation is a thing in in storytelling that I, I absolutely love. Um, I, Breaking Bad's my my favorite TV show, and I think that does <laughs> escalation better than like any other television show I've seen. So like. Um, in writing, in writing the book, I wanted to, I just wanted to escalate things over and over. And the way I escalated things were just these, like, these situations where um, Tiago is, is just confronted by grief in, in various ways, in, in all these different ways. And I think, you know, one, 
when you add it all up, it comes out to this crazy story of um, these these extremes that are happening to this one person. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the writing of it, it was just I was just following. It, I guess it was just it felt like I was just following a path that was just like laid out from like the previous decision. Um, it wasn't so much that I was like coming up with stuff as more that it was just like, OK, like what are the ramifications of this thing? And it just kept on uh, getting bigger and bigger, um, y- you know, and, and that's how I got to the end. <laughs> I, yeah. And I would say that the escalations thing, what I really appreciate as a horror fan and just a fat in general of narrative <laughs> is that uh, there were several times where I was like, wow, that by itself, that expanded, you know, or, or done a different way, that would be the end of a great story. And you kept going in ways that were very pleasurable and also very horrifying and poignant um, and didn't feel tacked on. But but it was just amazing to me how you, like you said, you kept doing these uh, these escalations that, 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 that packed so much uh, into this one novel without it without it, uh, with it, with, with it still having all this, this great structural integrity. So you mentioned grief, uh, and, and you writ, you wrote for Lit Hub, uh, about the grief that fueled the novel, losing, uh, your sister-in-law who you'd known since you were 10 to cancer, you know, what kind of distance do you need to write a real life trauma in a fictional context? Uh, and if so, what was the key or how did you find it, um, in writing this novel? You know, I had, I took a, uh, a nonfiction writing class when I was in college, um, my like junior year. And we were, we, we each, it was basically just work, like a big workshop. It wasn't so much a class as much as it was just workshopping. Um, and I distinctly remember this uh, girl who uh, like her essay was up for a critique that day. And her essay was of something that had recently happened, that that had happened, you know, within the semester. Um, and in reading the reading the essay, it just felt like um, it kind of felt like someone was just telling you the thing that was bothering them. Like someone was just like kind of like un- unloading their burden like on- onto you just because she was going through such a uh, hard thing. And the, I remember the teacher talking about what you know like in trying to navigate uh critiquing a a, an essay that was obviously very personal he came down on this idea of like of of distance and how maybe a little bit of time is is what is needed to then like give give the perspective that was missing in the essay um so when i came to this novel i didn't really have the idea of like of writing a novel. I guess what what ended up, what started this whole thing was just, um, I lost, I'd lost my sense of creativity. I, when Carol died, I, I lost any, any sense of writing books just because it it didn't feel like a, it didn't feel like a worthwhile thing in the face of, of a great loss. So what I, what I could do though, was just like write my feelings. Um, So that was really the, what like got the novel going. And I think maybe that that little step of like the it, fictionalizing this, like fictionalizing my grief, was never an intention. Um, but once I got into the idea of like, okay, like I think there's a novel here, um, I really wanted to focus on like making Tiago and Vera someone that people that were just distinctly different from me. Um, just because I, I didn't want I didn't want that like I didn't want Tiago to be a cipher I didn't want Vera to be a, a cipher for like you know someone that I I had lost I, I wanted them to just have their own distinct personalities their own distinct lives uh, and just to be individuals so I, I think maybe that's that focus is what helped the novel um, like kind of stand on its own as opposed to some type of like screen for myself or for for the feelings that I had, um, it was just really a focus on having these characters uh, live in their own story as opposed to being, you know, uh, my puppets. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some really interesting stuff that, you know, in, I think it's, it's actually pretty central to the novel as it goes along, but it's also interesting as detail 
you know, like the deceased boss wants a sign that she's okay. And the narrator, uh, Tiago, distrusts that. If he wanted it, then it wasn't anything special. And I'm curious, um, do you agree with Tiago? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think kind of I do because there is a there is a part of grief that um you know when I I get I guess when you're in it, when you're when you're in the, the thick of it, um you you see how it how grief has affects other people. And I, I think you see you see how people react to that grief. Um there are people who want to like make it their identity. Uh, there, there, are, there are people who are crushed by it. I think there are like so many different ways that people process grief that, you know, I, I don't want to say like some are valid and some are not, but I, I think when you are like, I guess when you're on like the ground floor of that grief and you see someone kind of like take that grief into, into somewhere that you like, don't agree with, like you, you have this like disconnect. Um, and I think for Tiago, as someone, he, you know, he, he loses his wife. I, I think for him to see other people kind of like go somewhere else with their, with their grief infuriates him. It, it enrages him because I think what, what they do with their grief is they essentially turn Vera into a different person. Um, because I think a big, a big theme in the, in the book is, you know, what is a person? What, are we, are we, a, a a story? Like is, a, is our life a story? And therefore we have this like narrative that, that we follow and you, you know, like people, when, when a person dies, you start to create this like narrative of like, oh, well, like maybe things were like, things fall in a certain way that it's like they were meant to happen and I think Tiago is really rebelling against that. So any any different form of grief that he doesn't identify with, he he sees as like he's hostile towards. Yeah. And while I I relate to that on some level, like I let Tiago just like go full force um, where I, like I couldn't. Yeah, I know that was a really powerful part of the the book. And then in addition to the rituals around death or loss, there's there's stuff that's ritualistic, but it's it's more like bureaucracy or politenesses, or even what you might call expected follow up. There's a, a reference of Tiago um, not being resentful, but aware of the expectation of regularly visiting the cemetery, right? For example, and so I was curious about that. There was a bit of a, a bit of horror to that as as well, being trapped in the expectation. So I'm just curious um, what your thoughts are since you've inhabited this subject on, you know, where's the line to individuality of expressions of grief? What, what are the expressions of grief that society is not as, as accepting of within all these kind of constrictions? If you don't mind the question, I'm just curious, just personally. Oh yeah. yeah. The audience is too. <laughs> I, I think what um, a lot of it for me, I think, when I started kind of like researching grief, just because um, I just felt so hungry when I when I'd lost uh, Carol, I felt so hungry for context. I felt so hungry for meaning that um, I didn't feel like a you, you know I'm I'm I don't I'm not I don't belong to any religion, so I, I really don't have that like that avenue to go down. So I kind of just felt like in in my own flux of, of like I, I don't really know where where to turn so what I ended up doing was just falling into um different cultures different traditions um I fell into like my own uh ethnic culture and looked into the ways like Aztecs um sought like looked at death and, and their rituals and I think what what is lost is just this idea of like of action to represent your your emotions like there we we don't really have some, uh, a type of ritual towards towards like grief where we like where we sacrifice something where we where we like take it take an action to symbolize the loss that that we feel i, I think there's something very like sterile mm -hmm. and um bureaucratic about like the way we go about death right now um 
that that just felt just made me feel incomplete. Um, so I think for for what Tiago is then going through is he's going through that through those similar disappointments and rages too. Um, when he talks about like I you know I wish. I wish there was some boulder I could lift uh, to then get me rid of this feeling just because I, I think like in our culture, we definitely don't don't have that. It's things are very, very sterilized um, just because I guess, you know, if we if we can't see it or feel it, then it must not be real. So like ignore it um, when but when when death is, you know, at your feet, like you realize like there's there are just so many different ways to process it that um, you kind of have to look beyond our, our normal ways of doing it, our like traditional, like American way of, of like going about death. And then, you know, just one last question about this, because it really does fascinate me in the social media age, do these rituals still work or they become distorted? Like, you know, the most obvious one for me is it feels like people pass away too quickly. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but, you know, you'll have some Facebook announcement or some thing on Twitter and then the next thing comes along. And I'm just curious how, how, how you feel about social media and, and death and grief. It's odd uh, just because there's a part of death that you feel like it's not real until it's been announced mm -hmm. on social media. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it creates this weird obligation um, I, you know, there, there was a part of me that felt a little, um, a little disgusted by the need to like express something over social media, uh, just because it, it, it also like there, there is a, com there is a component of like some type of gratification for yourself in it that, uh, that I really didn't like. And I don't know if that's a social media thing or if it's just that like, this is now how we come to like grief people. Um, whether whether we like it or not, this is, this is something that's like taken, taken place of like our old traditions. So it, I get a lot of times I think about like, well, is it, was it just like me that I, I needed to do this? Or was it like, I felt some type of outside obligation that I needed to do it? Um, but I'm not entirely sure just, just because like, you know, social media is also the way I can hear Carol's voice mm. still, mm -hmm. um, mm. you know, like it, it's still this like positive, it's still this like different force of like, oh, I can still process my grief through social media, like, like, because there's this record. Um, so it's a very, it's a difficult thing yeah. to like come down on one way or the other wow that's fascinating so uh, to, to shift a little bit and then after this question i think uh hopefully you'll, you'll do a reading for us from the book but you know at the heart of this book is is i kept thinking of the word possession and not in the literal sense always but of being possessed by something uh being possessed by emotion being possessed who is kind of a possession in this book uh because Vera is possessed in, in different ways. We've already kind of touched on it just in terms of perceptions after, after she passes away. Um, so I'm curious in terms of possession, how you, you view that word with regard to the novel. And I'm also curious if you have any like touchstones or favorites in the horror genre um, that, that, you know, maybe even weren't influences, but were things that are kind of, you know, influential on you in general. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to the possession angle, um, I really wanted to, I, I guess, just because the thing with like possession stories is that I, the, I guess the other end of the spectrum of that, like whatever possession is happening is, is this idea that like, you know, uh, whatever religion this, pos this possession mm -hmm. is taking place in, mm -hmm. you are like affirming those uh those, those things and you know while I, I have no objections to that it's not the the story i wanted to write i wanted to write a story that uh didn't have to grapple with the with the limitations of of some you know religious ritual or story 
Um, so the the real work came into like, how do you create like a secular demon, basically? <laughs> uh, and 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 that's like, I, that's that really like a that. real struggle. <laughs> as yeah. a as a secular person myself, I understand. <laughs> So I think that's where like the cosmic elements came yeah. in. Um, but like, I, I think when I think of possession, I guess I think I thought a lot of um, obligation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, if that makes a lot of sense. No, I think it does. This is why this word fascinated me with regard to the novel. <laughs> uh, it does. Uh, so, so yeah, like uh, I think a lot of times, like when, when these different things are trying to are put you're either possessing Vera or possessing Tiago. I thought of it more as just like these obligations that you just cannot get away from. Um, that, that to me was like the, the key, like into possession, uh, and kind of like branching it out from there. Um, I mean, I mean, my favorite possession story, the when like the one that like springs to mind is the exorcist three. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the see, I haven't seen that, and I, I keep you. I, I several people have now mentioned in, in like the last month that this is something that needs to be seen. <laughs> so. the yeah, The Exorcist Three is my favorite possession movie. I mean, <laughs> I will not say that it's better than The Exorcist, uh -huh. but for me, um, it's my favorite. It's my favorite of that franchise. Just it, it has so much going for it, and I think it has the like, it does, it does the perfect story thing that I like where it's it's a story of like you know I, I could go see this movie with my dad and my mm -hmm. dad would see uh, a detective story oh, okay uh, yeah. about you know a detective story that ends up becoming this like supernatural story and you know like there, there are beats there are beats that like he would be into and we could talk about it and it would be a great discussion and we would both enjoy the movie on that level but I also think there's another level to that movie where it's like it's George George C. Scott as is like the main uh, character, and he it's like at the tail end of his career, you can see like all of his like dread and experience of life just like sitting in his face. <laughs> um, but then on like another another level, it's about. Uh -huh. ret returning to um, returning to the first movie mm -hmm. and re and like. The, the idea that like nothing is resolved and you, you know, they're, they're like these higher things. I don't, I don't want to say higher, but like these different things mm -hmm. that I, I think someone who's like well-versed into like the literature um, and, and film could like enjoy it on this different level. Um, so by far, that's like my favorite possession movie. Um, and then it has like some of the best scares in the, in, in like all of horror. Um, for my money, Exorcist 3 has the, the best jump scare of all time. Well, I may actually, after this event, go, go and watch it then. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Um, so um, I just want to remind the audience uh, to get your questions uh, into the Q&A uh, for the last uh, part of this event. Uh, and then also, um, could you would you be willing to, to give us a reading, give us a taste of the novel? I'm yes, very... yes, of Thanks. course. Of course. Um, so this... Piece that I'm going to be reading. It's Vera and Tiago. Um, they're experiencing some weird things in their condo, and they've tracked down the uh, seller's real estate agent um, to try to get some answers from him. Uh, so that's where we're going to start. Calling the real estate agent was your idea, not our agent, but the seller's. We kind of knew who the seller was, but getting in contact with him was impossible. Our brownstone was one of a handful of properties this guy owned in Pilsen, and it was easy to spot his buildings because the exteriors were all painted the same beige color, with black trim and black vinyl window frames. The other properties housed businesses and were run by building managers who weren't about to offer up his name and direct phone number. The guy didn't show up for our closing, so even if we knew his name, we wouldn't know his face. We kept the paperwork from the closing in an empty UGG shoebox under our bed, and sitting cross-legged on the bedroom carpet, papers forming concentric circles around you, you found the real estate agent's name and agency. Still, I didn't think he would help. If we wanted to bitch about the property, he was probably going to tell us to talk to the inspector, not him. Then let us, then let him tell us no. We're the ones stuck here, Tiago. We have to at least try. You put the phone on speaker and set it on the counter, and we both listened to it ring. He picked up and you introduced yourself, 
giving him our address and telling him we met at the condo closing. He sounded apprehensive. You asked if he could tell us anything about the history of the building before it was rehabbed. Did something happen here? Was there anything weird about the space? We stared at the phone waiting for him to say something. Why do you ask, he finally said. The cold spots you had been walking through. It felt like one of them had passed through me as we stood there. My internal organs felt jumbled into the wrong spots. Because we've been experiencing things, you said, the mix of fear and adrenaline making the whites of your eyes pop. I know this sounds crazy, it's just, I'm sorry, ma'am, but any problems with appliances should have been brought up at the closing. No, you're not hearing me. His voice got far away, like he was shifting the phone off his shoulder to end the call. Please refer to the contract. You asked if that was the same contract requiring the, requiring the seller to disclose any defects with the property to the buyer, like our water pipe leaking into the unit below us, and how the downstairs neighbor told us they had repeatedly asked the agent's client to fix it, but he never did. And maybe the agent didn't know about this pre-existing problem, but maybe he did. Excuse me? But you blurted something about fiduciary responsibility and small claims court, and that shut him up. We both looked at each other. Next thing he said was, hold on a sec. The sound of wind cutting across the receiver suddenly disappeared, followed by a sharp thump. Sorry, just getting into my car. He took a deep breath. Look, I can reach out to Mr. Groff and see if he knows anything, but I don't think he'll be much help. He isn't much of a hands-on guy when it comes to tenants. But I toured the building with him after the last unit cleared, the one you purchased. An elderly woman had been living there age for ages. No one knew quite how long. She was very upset about being forced to move. I don't know whether she did this in retaliation or if this was how she was living, uh, but the unit was filthy. There was garbage piled in the corners. The toilet and tub were backed up. The smell was intolerable. The line went quiet. We looked at each other again. Hello, you said, did we lose you? In the living room was a circle of melted candles. In the center of it was an animal carcass. You don't realize how hard it is to identify an animal without fur or skin. Your hands flew up to your mouth. Oh my God. The agent kept talking. He said on the wall facing the carcass was a large rectangular shape drawn in blood. What do you mean? Looked like a giant door, he said. I don't know. I told Mr. Groff to call the police. This was obviously animal cruelty, but I think he just hired a couple guys to come in and clean it up before the demo started. Are you still there? Something in the living room caught my eye. A flash of movement. We both looked up and you, were extend and you extended your arm across my chest like we were about to rear end a car. A wave of white light slid across Itza's surface. The hexagons glowed and then spun around, trying to locate our voices. Was she listening to us, or had she been listening to us? It didn't matter. The hexagon spun another rotation and vanished. Whatever it was, it was too late to do anything about it. Creepy. Is there ever a good result to researching the history of a building in a horror novel? Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> One quick question that occurs to me. Um, do you believe in any kind of unexplained phenomenon um, like what Tiago and Vera experienced early on in the, in, the, in the apartment or is there always in real life a rational explanation? Oh, I mean, 100% I believe in like <laughs> super, I mean, like I have my own experiences. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I grew up well, like my grandmother owns an apartment building in Pilsen um, that is like notorious, like notorious in our family for being haunted. That like the family members know it's it's like haunted in some way. Um, but I've never I've never had an experience there. It's it's just like it's just it's just a it's known just thing. A, and yeah. and like family members have had experiences. So like I believe them. Mm -hmm. And um, my myself though in high school um, we my me, my mom, my brother, we uh, lived in this house in Bridgeport. Um, and that was like, for sure, haunted. Um, it started off as like this, like, strange feeling. 
Um, and then, and then things started happening that were just like easily, you know, easily explainable at the time, but like, it was kind of like, we didn't want to say what it was until we moved. And then it was like, all three of us were like, yeah, that was haunted. Right. <laughs> like, like that was like a scary place. Um, so for sure, I've like, I mean, there have, there have also been like other experiences that like, I mean, I like, I totally believe in them, but I don't want people to think I'm a crazy person. So like, I, like I'm, I'm comfortable like going to the grave with those experiences, but like, um, yes, I'm for sure. Um, I'm for sure that audience member who would have been yelling at Tiago, like to believe these yeah. things were happening. <laughs> I've, I've never had any experiences like that. Mostly it's been deja vu moments where things from dreams, little moments seem to be occurring in real life afterwards. I guess the closest thing was I was once stalked by a mountain lion on a hike and I never saw it directly, but I could feel it. And I felt like that was like being haunted by a ghost. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's like something in me knew I knew it was there. <laughs> I uh -huh. couldn't see it and hear it. Um, so another thing uh, that the book is um, kind of haunted by is media. Let's talk about Itza. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that, uh, was a line from Itza that struck horror in me, which is quite interesting <laughs> because you would think uh, that as kind of a pop culture line too, that that, that wouldn't, but it still still was fairly effective. Uh, you can't handle the truth, uh, which is another thing Itza says, <laughs> struck uh, terror in me for a different reason. Um, so I'm curious, is, is this also a dystopia in addition to a horror novel? Because it, it seemed like there were definite elements of commentary about technology in the present day and how we live with it. Yeah, in a way, in a way it is um, just because I think I, you know, for, for me personally, I, I, find, I find I don't hate technology, but I find it very um, oppressive. I find I find being so easily reachable very oppressive. Uh, like, and I don't mean that in like a general sense. I mean that like friends and family. <laughs> like, I find it, I find it very very like suffocating and, and oppressive. That like technology has just made it so easy. Like, it's it just seems so hard to. I mean, to like to essentially disappear. Like, you just feel so locked in into the way things are that especially when you're grieving someone it, you mm -hmm. find out like technology like becomes this force for like um it it, be, it becomes this this force now when i don't want to say evil but it, it becomes this like very antagonistic force mm -hmm. in your life mm -hmm. um so i it just it was so easy to like turn social media to turn the television to turn the news into this like oppressive thing just because it, it seems like when you're on the other side of that stuff like it can just get it, it can get overwhelming um so I felt like that had to be an element in the book that had to be another way to to kind of have the world just weigh down on Tiago to get him to make the um the like ultimate decision, which is to leave Chicago and move to Colorado. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is changing, but I can definitely remember a, a near uh, future, a, a near past phase where um, even as we have this new technology that it's not really being incorporated into horror. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, like in Annihilation, it was like easiest to just have modern tech not work in Area X rather than try to deal with text messages and crap. Um, so I feel sometimes like you see a lot of closing down in like horror movies and things, cell phones never work, you know, you, you right. all this kind of stuff. Is there a kind of a challenge to using modern tech in a way that's kind of like horrific? I mean, you, you, you do it so beautifully in this, in this book. Was there anything that you just were like, ah, no, that doesn't actually work. Um, you know, it was a horror movie that kind of, uh, spurned me on to like, try to find different ways. Um, I think it's paranormal activity four ah, they, you're pretty deep into the paranormal activity movies oh you know what no that's straight reading wikipedia pages oh because <laughs> uh, so i mean like going back going back to like, our like supernatural experiences 
I'm, I'm because of like the things I've experienced, I'm, I'm terrified of ghost stories. Oh, okay. So um, you don't want like, to experience them directly there. Yeah. So like I, I, I saw, I saw the first wow. paranormal activity, like per midnight premiere mm -hmm. in the, in the first row of the theater. Um, and it was like, it scarred me. I, I oh, was God. like so terrified of it. So I, I, <laughs> I've read the wiki pages of like the sequels. <laughs> Was That's that still scary? I mean, no, given that you're scared, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> not, at, not at all, but it was like, I was like, okay, I can just still be in the know. <laughs> of these things. Uh, so it's in Paranormal Activity 4. They use um, the Xbox Connect, um, like it, it's, it's a sensor for the Xbox mm -hmm. that can like read your motion um, while you're like playing a video game. So they use it to like, to track the ghosts in the mm -hmm. movie, which mm -hmm. I thought was genius. I was like, oh that is yeah. That's kind of cool actually, yeah. That's a great idea yeah. to like use uh, contemporary technology in a, in a ghost story. So I kind of felt like a challenge. I felt like, okay, well, like how do I then, how do, how do I do that? Um, I wanted to write my own ghost story with uh, contemporary technology. And it was, I mean, the smart speaker was the first thing that I, I thought of just because you talk to it. Um, mm -hmm. It just feels like you have a relationship, which is weird. So um, I was like, that, that has to be that it. Is weird. That, has, <laughs> that has to be the main thing is this smart speaker. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about, about movies now, uh, including movies that you apparently can't see within the horror <laughs> genre, um, which I won't, I won't press you on more uh, about that, but, you know, what are some of your favorite horror movies? Um, if you don't mind me asking, it's just, a, I'm always curious. Yes. Yeah. Oh, favorite horror movies. Um, I feel like I have, I have like a, a type where I like, I like ensembles. And um, for some reason, I like the, the, the like horde in, in a horror movie. I like whatever the evil thing is. I like a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um and I, I like it to be like unrelenting so like <laughs> the thing is is like okay, one of my yeah. favorite horror movies um there is the first uh tales of the crypt movie demon knight uh -huh. is like one of my favorite horror movies <laughs> just because it's it also it's also this movie that does that, that does the thing that i absolutely love where it's this like schlocky b movie but it also has this little bit where they're like, yeah, our, our demons are demons because, well, demons existed before um, God created the heaven and the earth. And maybe demons mm -hmm. feel like they uh, belong here first. But uh, forget about that. Let's go back to like the cool stuff. And it's like, whoa, whoa, wait, like that's a crazy idea. Um, and they have this like little uh, montage where they show the demons kind of like in these like big moments in human history but it really has no like it, it never is returned to in the movie that like um i don't know for me like i i absolutely love that that like the the filmmakers gave me this like little nugget that my mind can create like an entire universe for but yet there's still this like this, yeah B movie that i can enjoy on this like other different level um so things like that like another b movie uh from dust till dawn yeah. um there's also this uh zombie horror franchise um i think it's spain i think it's a spanish horror franchise uh wreck it's oh yeah 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 i yeah, that's an interesting one yeah. I love that franchise I, that's one i can't really it, it's hard for me to watch all the <laughs> yeah. way through i don't know why that one creeps me out but that one really does so yeah. i have to be doing something else while i'm watching it to kind of like vacuum <laughs> i know that sounds weird but with you know it's just because it really creeps me out that one. it's super super <laughs> super creepy um i've heard like the fourth one is like the worst of the franchise mm. and i still can't bring myself to to watch it just because mm. i like I know how scary the first yeah. three were so i'm like even <laughs> even a bad wreck movie is still going to be scary yeah so um, later in uh, the thing, this thing between us, it does move from uh, Chicago, from an urban setting to a very isolated woods. Uh, and I really, I, I really adored that uh, because it felt also like 
you know, you have the surface of the story and the things that are continuous, but then you also, I mean, I, I'm aware just because I, 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 you know, I read so much of this stuff of like the horror trope shifting and the weird phenomena shifting and we're out in the woods and, and all the reference points to, you know, you know, not necessarily horror that you were influenced by, but horror that I've read, you know, kind of come into play in the back of my head in a really nice way, like not a derivative way, but just a nice, nice way. So I'm curious, how dependent do you feel the landscape is for horror in terms of what can you do? What did you gain by by putting Tiago in isolation out in the woods in addition to using the dog in so many different ways? Oh, I think it plays a huge part in, in the horror. Just, um, just because I think there are different, you know, there are different genres just based on yeah. setting. Yeah. Um, so that was something I wanted to play with. Uh, the, I mean, the original concept of the book I had you know, it was going to go Chicago, Colorado to um, Antarctica. Just really, I, yeah. <laughs> just, wow. Yeah, yeah, Which I mean, is a favorite setting for me, frankly, Antarctica. I don't know why, but <laughs> uh, yeah, like Tiago was going to take one of those like <laughs> National Geographic uh, like tours to um, Antarctica to visit like one of those like uh, remote station towns uh -huh. yeah. just to just to get away from like the thing haunting him. Yeah. Um, just because because of that idea, because of like when you like put the character in these different settings, now you have like different tools to play with. Yeah, right. Because um, it felt like, you know, you're, the the first section is like a haunted house movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, haunted house story. But once we get into Colorado, it becomes like a completely, mm -hmm. it shifts into yeah. like what you said of just like the, the wilderness, um, animals, then the idea of like isolation, um, and I wanted it. I wanted it to, to shift it again. Um, but what I ended up finding another way of doing it, you know, returning back to color to Chicago, and having Chicago and cosmic horror come together, uh, which was something I thought you know wasn't really like explored um, as far as I'd read or seen. Mm -hmm. Just just cosmic horror in a in an urban setting. Yeah. Um, so like. I, I think it plays it plays like a a huge role, and it was something that I was I was very cognizant of. Yeah, no, and it 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 it. it, it I, I know this is going to sound weird, but it just it because it's it is a poignant story, it is a horrific story. But I also had it just as a writer, and I don't know if you can always tell this, you know, but I just felt like you were having a lot of fun writing this as well on some level on some of it i'm sure some of it was not as fun to write but but i definitely got that sense when when we got out into the woods and i could i could see you know what you're talking about it was it was quite it was it was it was it was very um weirdly refreshing even as i was really terrified at times <laughs> too um so there's a, a a marvelous line in the novel i tried catching you but you fell through me and uh I was this this made me think about like the demarcation between the real and the unreal, the metaphorical and the real. Does there need to be a clear demarcation? I mean, I think Tiago loses loses that demarcation at times and comes back to it, but but how do you feel about that? Like are there times when there's things that are happening just in Tiago's head? You know, I I like the idea. So um when I wrote the book, I thought there was like a very, I thought it could only be read one way. And mm -hmm. that was the way in my head. Um, and I, I, once I was finished, I gave it to my wife uh, and she read it. And at the end she was like, oh, so it was basically like this happened. And it was something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, something I, I had no intention of. And when, like, when she told me it, I was kind of like taken aback because I was like how could you how could you even get that from this book I was so <laughs> kind of like upset but then I was like that is so um I love that so much that I'm just going to like leave the book like that and but in in the writing of it um I never really cared and I not that not that there was never an answer like I, I did have this like I do have this idea of like you know, what is happening, what is real, what is not real. Um, but, you know, my favorite director is David Lynch. I, like one of my favorite directors. <laughs> is yeah. Um, and we were just talking about Brian Evanson earlier. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I love the not knowing. Yeah. Um, I think that's the, my, f my favorite thing about horror is like the person that survives is the person mm -hmm. who kind of like 
comes to terms with not knowing mm -hmm. and and finds finds some type of like buoyancy in in the not knowing and like finding a way to like move through it without the answers um i i just absolutely love that just because i think that's life i think that, yeah yeah that's that's all of us um so so if anything i really i really do get a kick out of presenting things as real and then just like making it as unbelievable as possible um just because <laughs> i like the reader not knowing i like that that feeling of um of like you're like i i feel like i'm kind of going crazy <laughs> like I, that, <laughs> that's that's a feeling that i i enjoy playing with yeah. and when i when i hear that of like of of like people you know not understanding but also not caring and i'm like that's mm -hmm. yeah that's like the absolute uh joy that i get out of reading and reading other works so like um, if people like have that feeling reading this book, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's one of the joys of a first person narrator too. And, and the reader kind of like putting together some puzzle pieces towards the end. Um, it was never confusing. It was just really a, another interesting dimension to mm -hmm. it, which is why I asked, um, did you creep yourself out any, at any points, uh, writing the novel? I mean, I, I, I have a couple of times, not necessarily in the expected places writing my own, but, but it, I, I don't know if it feels like a self, uh, too self-conscious a question but but did you oh yeah what like all of the <laughs> stuff comes from, comes from me <laughs> me not expecting the answer i got from my alexa <laughs> oh oh, oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that i was that i was like oh my god that's horrifying that's a horrifying feeling um and yeah like that that's that's where like um when i was like writing those things i was like it was just like trying to put me back into those feelings, those situations where I was just like so scared. Yeah. Um, like that, I, I don't know why that, that scares me the most out of like anything writing the book were just the, uh, the times that Tiago is interacting with Itza. I just found the, the most unnerving for me. Uh, and it, I think it become it comes from that, from me being like, from not paying attention and asking Alexa what the yeah. weather was, she tells me something else. <laughs> I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that maybe there's an element of, um, for me at least, the creepiness comes from this idea that there might be some kind of surveillance going on as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple more questions and then we'll go to audience questions and please get some questions and some Q&A because if you don't, we'll spend the last five minutes with uh, Gus and I uh, singing show tunes, um, which at least on my end is not gonna not gonna sound very good. Um, I don't know, if, Gus, if you sing or not, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not I'm not a good singer. So okay, so this would be tragic to yeah, have happen. Tragic. So you're gonna some of you are gonna have to step up here. Um, so you know, as somebody who's who's you know, I started out in the horror genre, and I think almost everything I write still has some kind of horror at at the heart of it. I kind of, um, I keep up with the horror genre and you see it, you know, wane and wax in popularity and get redefined and suddenly there's upscale horror and downscale horror, whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Um, and horror flared up again this year as kind of a hot category. You know, you had um, Stephen Graham Jones' novel hit it really big and and, um, and uh, Sylvia's novel. And, uh, you know, is it coincidence? Is it something about the moment? Uh, is it about a... Uh, a way of dealing with things? Is it an escapist impulse? Is it all of those things? I mean, do you have any theories about, about why, why this, this is this year? You know, it's weird. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's kind of like you follow, you follow the same band for years mm. and then you mm. go to the concert and you see like, there's like thousands of people there <laughs> um, and they're all like, Oh my God, this band's awesome. And then you're like, yeah. where did you come from? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what it feels like to me when, when I like read things about like, you know, the like horror boom that I'm like, we've yeah. always been here. <laughs> yeah. like, um, but I, I guess I, I, I think maybe it's the, the new faces. Mm. Um, I mean, new faces for the general public, just because right, like right. Stephen Graham Jones, uh, Sylvia, uh, Garcia Moreno, like yeah. or Sylvia Moreno Garcia, they've been like they, around for a while been, yeah yeah, yeah. So, for a while. Like, yeah so like we've been up on them but like i think now it's it's like the general audience is getting a taste for it um and i think too like 
you know, uh, Lovecraft Country what was an mm, HBO show right, right. Uh, That's a true. year ago. Like, I think I think these different styles of horror. I guess I don't know. I get I don't know what the what the category would be. I don't want to say I don't want to say literary horror. I really don't want to say <laughs> literary horror. But it, but I I do feel the like I I know what people t- are talking about when they refer yeah. to horror books like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess I, d- I don't know what spurned it on, but I do, I do get that there's like this like big push now for like these d- different kinds of horror. And I'm like, I'm all for it. I feel like horror is, a, it, I'm horror is the genre that like, I want to like work in. Mm-hmm. So like to, to see people having an interest in what's getting written now, like I'm, I'm happy about it. It, it's another thing I can't explain, but, but like, I'm, I'm happy to just go with it. Well, that leads me to my last question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, are you working on something else now? Are you just basking in the glow of this novel or do you have something else in the works? Are you? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> definitely working on, on something. I'm working on a, a book. I don't want to say too much on it, okay. but like it uh, takes place in uh, North Carolina on the Appalachian Trail. Oh, okay. Uh, and it it deals with vampires. I'll, okay. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> so it's like those two elements, and it's like, yeah, it, it deals with family. Um, so I'm really. I knew there were going to be more elements. <laughs> oh my god! Oh. <laughs> Having read this book, I know there's going to be a lot of elements. <laughs> oh yeah, like there there are definitely. <laughs> you like, just yeah. I've got. But I've I understand got, the impulse not to want to talk too much about it. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I've got like a few ideas, and I'm like, oh my god, I I have to like write this book as fast as I can. <laughs> um, so yeah, like that, that is the thing that I'm working on right now. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll go to, to questions then. And I may have a couple extra questions too. I can type into the Q and A, but. I see we do have a question here. Um, and thank you guys, by the way, for that conversation. That was, that was wonderful. Oh, sure. um, this is from uh, Gary. Uh, like Tiago, um, I've been hit with the you're not a real Mexican uh, nonsense too many times throughout my life. Is this something you've experienced firsthand? Oh, 100%. 100%. Uh, it's something I've experienced. And, I, you know, I knew race was going to be uh, a topic in the book uh, just because, you know, once Tiago and once Vera's story reaches the media, I think it's hard for the media not to... Um, like inc- include the, the race component in into like what's happening between them. So, you know, I thought what better way to explore race than, than like the, the situations that I find myself in. I'm, I'm like a Mexican person, um, but I, I also have these like, sit, these like situations within my own Mexican culture um, of just not feeling like I belong, feeling like uh, I'm accepted. And it, it was something that I thought was like a, a unique a unique opportunity for me. I, as, a, as a Mexican writer, I think it's something I could write on that most other writers uh, either couldn't or wouldn't. So I, it was something I was really, really intent on bringing to the page. Um, and I, I, Tiago goes through it way to, a, to an extent that like I've never experienced before. Um, but it, it was important to get that get that on the page just because I, I felt like it was something not really addressed in, uh, you know, books or movies or in popular culture in general. Just, you know, the idea of like being a minority and not only being a minority in America, but then kind of feeling like a minority within your own minority, if that makes any sense. Wow. So if anybody else has any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box. We do have a little bit of time left. I just had one question that I had kind of wanted to, to, to ask, and it just kind of got lost in the, in the shuffle. You know, there's also there's something you could call just like a, a really um, interesting energy in some of the scenes, but also you could call humor. Do you think humor has a role in horror? Because there's bits of, of Itza, for example, that are satire you know, verging on scary and also funny at the same time, kind of in the way that at least I think Thomas Ligotti and Brian Evanson, and Brian Evanson has admitted to this, he, he, he thinks he's funny sometimes, <laughs> even in horror, uh, even if sometimes grad students he's reading to don't think so. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I'm just curious what you think of, uh, of that question. You know, I, 
I don't know if horror is like necessary for, uh, I mean, if I don't know if like humor or is necessary in like for horror, but I do know it's, it's for sure necessary in my own writing. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something, I mean, it was, a I can't remember what it, what it was, but it was, uh, a John Waters interview where, um, the interviewer had asked, had asked him, you know, what, what happens when, when a, something you're working on is like going the wrong way? Like, well, what if something's bad? Like, how do you, how do you fix it? How do you deal with these different things? And in like typical John Waters style, he was just like, you know, if, if it's funny, the audience will forgive you for anything. Um, and, and I read that at, at a very like formative time that I was like, for whatever reason that that just always that's always stuck in my mind of this like if it's funny like the audience will forgive you for anything and I think I've I've kind of like twisted that twisted that now into like if it's funny I can do anything <laughs> like if there's if there's humor in the book um, the audience will forgive me for whatever else like happens around that stuff so for me humor has has become this like um this 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 way to curry favor with the audience in between doing these like terrible things <laughs> to them and, and to the characters that like horror is like i mean humor is, is indispensable to me as far as like writing horror we just got actually another question and i think is a pretty good last question um from lucy fox uh, you reference a lot of movies as inspiration, uh, especially with horror. I think there are certain stories that are better on the page. Uh, would you consider adapting this or any of your work into film? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, I wanted to be a film director before uh, an author. That was from like, I can't remember a time I didn't want to be a film director, if that makes sense. Uh, it wasn't until I got into high school and I read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Um, that just blew my mind. Um, it, I read it. It was it was like a crazy year where like I read Siddhartha and I saw The Matrix in theater like on the like the the premiere weekend. So it like my like fourteen year old mind just like like had I guess like the closest thing to like an acid trip in that week <laughs> just like seeing The Matrix and then reading Siddhartha. That it, I was like oh. I want to be a writer, um, but I still think I, I I write in a very uh, cinematic way, just because like movies are are the are my language. Like movies, like movies are the language I grew up with. Movies are the way I kind of like ex you know experience the world. So even when I write, I, I do visualize things very very cinematically. Um, so the idea of like adapting my own work is something I'm very, very keen on something, um, I'm like in the process of doing as well. So like, it's something that, um, I'm looking forward to do more of in the future. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to keep one eye open for it. Uh, this thing between us, like coming to Netflix and <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. All right, guys. Um, unfortunately we are, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, Jeff for being here sure. and for um, talking with us today. And Gus, thank you so much and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brookline Booksmith. Jeff, thank you so much. That was this great. Was like, <laughs> such a huge honor. So thank you so much. And anybody out there who still uh, would like to get a copy of Gus's book, uh, you can go to the Eventbrite page where you registered for this event. Um, you can get a copy there. You can go to our online store, brooklinebooksmith.com, or you can just come on into the store uh, we have a bunch of copies waiting for you. We have a bunch of Jeff's books uh, waiting for you too. Uh, so please come on by. And uh, once again, everybody, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Gus. Good night. Thank you, guys. See ya. Good night, everybody.